That's Nick. And that's Joseph. And today we're here to talk about Antebellum, which is the directorial debut of Gerard Bush and Christopher Renz, uh, which will be available to stream uh, digital and demand and in some theatrical uh, venues, uh, September 18th, 2020, courtesy of Lionsgate. Um, it was uh, due to have been released last April, but has been consistently delayed. Uh, but I think it's probably being released at about the right time, actually. Yeah, due to the subject matter. Yes, for the sure. the current social climate. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, the basic story is we find a woman, Dr. Veronica Henley. Played by Janelle PhD, Monet. Played by Janelle Monet. She's a sociologist, an activist, and a successful author. Mm -hmm. She's written a book called... Uh, shedding the uh, coping persona. Shedding the coping persona. Mm -hmm. So she is on a book tour, mm -hmm. like to promote her book. She, uh, well, I'm telling the story kind of out of sequence. Well, I, I think she's invited to like a symposium. That's right. Uh, well, yeah. you're right. So we find it's hard to tell because I'm telling it out of sequence. Oh, yeah, she, major, major spoilers. Major spoiler alerts. So she gets up in the morning, mm -hmm. and, you know, to her beautiful man, her beautiful child, her beautiful home, they're in the kitchen. She's watching herself on TV. She's debating a man who's a eugenist, mm -hmm. this racist-ass white man. She's, they're, like, uh, debating. She's killing it. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> we then move on to her uh, same morning in the house, she takes a Skype call that her assistant has set up from a woman who's played by... Jenna Malone. Jenna Malone. Elizabeth. Who's this sort of like condescending white woman. With a southern drawl. With yeah. a southern drawl. It's not a very good one. Who's though. basically telling her like she wants to work with her. Mm-hmm. And Jenna... And Veronica's like, mm, no, I'm good. Cut to she's flown to uh, New Orleans mm -hmm. to speak at a conference. Mm-hmm. And she's, uh, she's also there, or her best friend played by Gabri Sidibe is mm -hmm. there. So they speak at the conference, and that night they decide they're going to go out for dinner mm -hmm. and to party with a third person, their white friend, whose name I don't recall. Sarah. Sarah. So while they're at dinner, um, Veronica decides that she does not want to go out. So Sarah and Gabourey's character go out that night, but Veronica says she has to get up early in the morning to fly back home, so she's just going back to her hotel. Well, she's picked up by what she thinks is her Uber, but really it's uh, Jenna Malone's character mm -hmm. and Veronica, Jenna Monet's character, is being kidnapped. Mm -hmm. So we find her at a plantation. They refer to it as a, as a reformation or a... Yeah, um... Jack Houston's character has this little speech when some new slaves are brought uh, in that says it's a, a, a reform, a reformation plantation. Anyway, they're at a plantation. So they've been made slaves. Mm -hmm. And we basically see Janelle Monet. She's the focus. Mm -hmm. And it's her sort of dealing with that and how she's going to escape. Mm -hmm. She does successfully escape the end. Okay. It was difficult to tell because that is not how the film no, no. is oriented. It opens with Janelle Monet being dragged back to this plantation. And, and as that's happening, we see uh, a, a woman shot and killed while her uh, man, uh, Eli... A black woman who's a slave uh, has tried to escape. Mm -hmm. And she's been shot and killed because mm -hmm. she tried to escape. And then we see Janelle Monet's character with one of the slave masters... She refuses to say her slave name, which is Eden. Mm -hmm. So he beats her and then brands her. Mm -hmm. And then we move on with sort of more slaves coming in. One slave in particular seems very rebellious. Like she doesn't, she's like, we have to, I, I can't do this. We have to get out of here. Kiersey Clemens. But Veronica is saying, no, we need to do what they tell us. We need to wait mm -hmm. when the time is right. More bad things happen. And then we hear a cell phone ring and then Janelle Monet's character wakes up in modern time. Mm -hmm. So that's at the 40 minute mark. Mm -hmm. So the first 40 minutes of the film, we think we're in sort of like 1800s, 
Yeah, like Confederate uh, era, underground like, railroad era. Yeah. Yeah, and and we're just seeing what's happening on a plantation. I actually think spoiling the movie works better because I tried to watch this movie last night. Yeah, you... and I didn't know what it was about, and I watched the first ten minutes and turn and, and left. Yeah, I had to finish it alone. Yeah, I couldn't because the the intros. Them at the plantation seemed a little off. Yeah, for, for multiple I, reasons. Yeah, for multiple reasons, and on purpose. On purpose, and we'll get to it. But once I knew what it was about, when you spoiled it for me, I was able to watch it this morning, and I loved it. This film was excellent. I think because I wasn't so distracted by what was off at the plantation, I was really able to look at the little things, and I think it works beautifully. Well, because otherwise, you know, it's it's very brutal. The first forty minutes are pretty brutal, and. It feels, since there's so much that feels kind of off about it, it feels ex exploitative. Yes. So the screener we received, the filmmakers are, they open the film, mm -hmm. uh, saying why they did it and why it's important. The main thing I took away is the one says that all of the brutality we see in the film is based in truth. Mm -hmm. I thought that was an important... Because... Knowing, now having watched it, I feel like it doesn't feel exploitative. No, I, no. It's very effective. And another statement, uh, I believe it was Gerard Bush that made the statement about that it's a film that's of and for this moment. Yeah. Which I think is the, probably the most apt way to describe it. My first thought, so my first note after completing it was, I think as a person of color and growing up and like hearing other people of color talk about slavery, comedians and film, regular people, oftentimes I would hear people say like, man, if I were a slave back then, they wouldn't have kept me. Like I would have escaped. I would have killed everyone. And it's like, no, you wouldn't have. Because the conditions, the system did not support the alternative. Like, you were a slave. That was it. And I think this film does a really good job of demonstrating because all of the slaves that were, are on this plantation in this film, they're all, like, educated, affluent, successful black people. I.e. threatening to the white establishment. Threatening to the white mm -hmm. establishment. And they couldn't escape. Because it's just like, that's not your reality, and the system is not supporting otherwise. Right. Well, they're kidnapped without weapons, uh, disoriented, waking up. Brutalized. They, they have no idea where they are. They have no idea where they are. If they try to run, where are they going to go? Which is what s slavery was. Yeah. <laughs> That's like, why slaves weren't allowed to read or learn mm -hmm. how to write, so that if you're uninformed, you just you really have don't have a lot of options. Mm -hmm. So I think this film did a really good job of showing, like, you know, for all that crazy talk people have about what they would have done during slavery, it's like you wouldn't have done shit but what you were told because... What? Same with what people talk about. Oh, if I had lived during the Holocaust, I wouldn't have put up with this. And it's like, well, we're kind of going through a similar scenario. Like, there's all those memes and tweets about what if you ever wondered what you thought you would do during Nazi era Germany, you're doing it right now. Yeah. <laughs> Which is that? Um, I think, like, this movie should be watched more than once. Definitely. Uh, I think it's much more enriching uh, on a second watch. Uh, to, I mean, it's frustrating. I, th I think especially right now, too. Uh, and I do appreciate the statement that the directors made beforehand. Is uh, It's still important to watch. Like, the scenes are brutal and it's hard to sit through, but uh, it's still worthwhile, even if it is uh, triggering. And uh, because these are headlines we're seeing in the daily news about black bodies beaten and tortured, like, why do we want to watch that to be entertaining? Well, the reason I said it's worth watching more than once is because... If you don't know what the film's about, I think you'll be distracted. So mm -hmm. you won't catch a lot of the nuances. Mm -hmm. I only watched it once, but I knew the spoiler. So I really picked up on a lot of things that I thought were really interesting and really well done. Mm -hmm. um, so some of the things that threw me off uh, when I tried to watch it the first time have to do with them on the plantation before we know that it's set in modern time. Mm -hmm. um, the woman in the beginning who attempts to escape, she has like a gold ring, like, in her like, nose, like yeah. a septum piercing mm -hmm. or not a septum, whatever you call that thing, like in your nose. Mm -hmm. And then she has like a nice gold chain with like a cross on it. And that immediately threw me off because I'm like, well, you wouldn't have had that mm -hmm. back then. Um, one of the new slaves who's brought in, the one, Kirstie Clemens, mm -hmm. she immediately says like, what is this? 
Which I thought was weird because well, it's also, like, well, if you're a black person in the 1800s, you know what slavery is. Right. Well, and also when she sees Janelle Monet, she, she recognizes her. She recognizes her. And it's like, well, how would you, because she says, I'm from, I'm from North Carolina, you're from Virginia. I recognize you. I know who you are. And it's like, well. You're my only hope to get out of here. You wouldn't have known back then. But because Janelle's character is famous mm -hmm. in modern time, that's why she knew her. Um the that same woman gets kind of into an argument with Janelle Monet's character because Veronica doesn't want to like she wants to take it slow. Well, she's already attempted an escape and become branded. Right. So, yeah, so she's, she's a little anxious. Mm -hmm. But the other slave says being quiet means so to you being quiet means being strong. Where has that gotten us? You're not a leader, you're just a talker. Mm -hmm. And that threw me off, too, because I thought, like... Yeah, what are you talking about? What are you talking about? Yeah. This woman is, like, what, what power do slaves have? What leaders are there? But it's because she knows that she's well, famous. And also how the plantation looks. It looks new. Like the, the, the... That also threw me off. The plantation looks a little too nice. Mm -hmm. And I just thought, oh, that's a function of the production. You know, like, maybe they didn't have the money to really... But no. So... That's why I think knowing the twist before will really help you see it and not judge it. Well, because um, it's a movie. It's, okay. Good. So, during the first part of the film, while they're on the plantation, there's like a dinner scene where all the white people and the slave masters are having dinner, and of course, the, the black slaves are serving them. And the, the main slave master gives a speech, and part of it, he says, this land was always ours. You are all the future, talking to the younger people. Um, and I don't think he was talking about like winning the civil, like, like the Confederacy winning no. the Civil War, because that's what this place is so, sort of hiding as, like a Civil War reenactment camp. Well, but really, what he was talking about were all these black people there uh, kidnapping and enslaving. Mm -hmm. That, like, he's commenting on how like black people are trying to take our land, people of color, mm -hmm. and that you young people need to like keep this shit going. Well, because Antebellum, this is the name of the plantation Civil War reenactment place they're at, means, of course, uh, uh, pre-Civil War era. So Gone with the Wind is Antebellum era is where that starts. And so that's to them, and what people that say this means, you know, when you, when you say make America great again, that, that's what they mean. Or when you say you're conservative, <laughs> it's like you're trying to conserve these old ass racist yes. ass values, which it, which was only in its purest form, technically speaking, for white people in this era. Something else that threw me off was um, the slaves are burning the cotton. And I'm like, well, why because they you? don't need it. it because they don't need it, <laughs> which makes sense. But too. it's like, why would they be burning the cotton? Because that was an act of attrition back then. Like the slaves, you know, would like burn the equipment, burn the land to hurt the mm -hmm. slave owners. But I'm like, but they're burning the cotton like right in front of everybody, everyone. Yeah, like as they're picking it. But it's because what are they gonna do with it? You can't sell bushels of cotton. Like <laughs> that would just draw attention to the, the site. Um, at the same dinner scene, one of the younger white guys is sort of timid, talking to one of the black slave girls, mm -hmm. the for the pregnant one, mm -hmm. and um, I thought that was very interesting, until we find out that he. He, he just was afraid of her mm -hmm. because it's said in modern times and he knows that this shit is not the natural order. Well, Later I, on I in think the they film, knew that then too, but... Right, yeah, but, but so then he's too timid to talk to her so one of the slave owners comes by and says like, he takes control and tells the, the slave, you need to be ready for him in his room. after dinner in his room, like get ready to have sex with him. So when they do... He's very timid. She thanks him for being kind, and then he flips the script. Mm -hmm. He like beats her up and says, "I'm in control. Don't you ever talk to me this casually." And so, uh, yeah, I thought that was very interesting. Well, also the fact that and this was not a term I was familiar with the sapphires. Yes. So, the one slave owner comments uh, at the dinner scene, like, "Oh, don't forget, everyone. These sapphires are here for our like uh, pleasure and our like." For us to use and i had never heard that term before but sapphire is a derogatory or defamatory de defamatory term for like basically an angry black woman so it's like the opposite of so back then this is what i read because i didn't know you know like sort of this mammy version of a black woman mm -hmm. is what people preferred because they were nurturing and easy to handle and the opposite which we would call like an angry black woman were called sapphires 
Which, so when he referred to them as that, I'm like, well, that doesn't make sense. Like, what is that? If mean? they're slaves, why would they be Gemstones. like so strong? Well, no. <laughs> well, after I looked it up, I'm like, but they're not. Like they don't have agency and they're not strong. Right, because but they are. They That's are, why they're there. They're because, targeting certain women. Yeah. Yeah, these people are trying to squash these strong, powerful mm-hmm. black people. Which there and there's a, uh, I guess, not having known that there's a Wayne Blair film from like 2012 called The Sapphires about a group of it's Australian. <laughs> Excuse me, but. Um, I'm just gonna keep going through my notes. Mm-hmm. The one slave master I thought looked like Jason Sudeikis, <laughs> especially when Jason Sudeikis does the, like, Southern Justice oh, skit on yeah. SNL. You're talking about Eric Lang, the one that's raping Janelle Monae. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And the other one is Jack Houston, uh, who is a nephew to Angelica and Danny. He's part of the Houston family empire. So continuing with sort of the fucked up nature of this film, there's a character named Eli who's played by... Uh, he's a newcomer, uh, Tange Ch- Charissa. So he's Probably featured in the begin- the opening scene where we see the black female trying to escape, who's killed. The man who we assume is her husband, he's like in- shackled. He, later on in the film, is told by one of the slave masters to go clean this area. Which is a crematorium. Which is actually a crematorium. And he finds in the rubble or the ashes her... A gold chain with the mm-hmm. cross and then he realizes that he's actually like, sifting through her bones and her ashes. Yeah, that was a very troubling. Story. That was very troubling. Mm-hmm. But that cremium, that crematorium has relevance uh, later. Oh yeah, so, it comes in news. Probably the best scene I've seen in a while. Mm-hmm. Um, so at the 40 minute mark then we jump to Janelle Monet's character Veronica mm-hmm. waking up in her own bed in her beautiful home um, and then there's the breakfast scene and the daughter is watching Veronica watch herself on the news debating this racist ass white man and the daughter kind of asks like why is he so angry Mm -hmm. and Janelle says that sometimes anger is really fear Mm -hmm. and she gives a really great speech about like what that means and then the daughter said because she she ends with like but that's how you can become friends Mm -hmm. like how you had a bully in school and I confronted them and now you're friends Mm -hmm. so the daughter asks so are you friends and she says well not you know not just yet (laughs) But I took that to mean, like, the relationship between white Americans and black Americans. Yeah, no. So I, I thought it was very powerful. I, I think, and as an overall statement, I think every exchange in this film is meaningful. Yeah, very thoughtful. And, and, like, there's not really uh, any kind of dead weight anywhere. In it. Another important scene, well, they're all important, but um, when Janelle Monet's character is taking that Skype call, that video call from Jenna Malone's character... Mm-hmm. She's doing that white lady's doing that thing where she's like, Oh, you have such a nice home. Oh, your daughter's so beautiful. Oh, that lipstick looks really good on you. On like, your skin tone. Like, oh, I wish I could wear that. It looks good on your skin tone, but not on mine. Mm-hmm. And then she, when the call's done, uh, Veronica wipes the lipstick yeah. off. Yeah. <laughs> I thought that was great. When we first find Veronica in her hotel in New Orleans before her speech, she has a yoga instructor. A white lady. A white lady, mm-hmm. like practicing yoga, you know, and training her with yoga before Gabourey's character comes in. I know that was an interesting dynamic. Because Gabourey comes in and kind of barely acknowledges this woman who suddenly becomes kind of cold and standoffish once uh, Gabourey Sidibe is in the, in the sequence. Um, and we, we kind of had a long conversation, well, about all the white characters in this film and kind of the different hierarchies of... Yeah, but I think the film did a good job of sort of curating like the different types of white characters because then you also have the white friend, Sarah. Right. But Gabourey's character, um, well, we'll get to that because that's not all the way down. Um, Throughout the film, Janelle is kind of, she has like three sort of references, like nightmares. Mm -hmm. Like she, like we see her wake up from a nightmare, then her husband asks her, and then the Gabourey's character asks her, I think. Mm -hmm. And Veronica says that, um, that she thinks maybe it's our ancestors haunting us, so Mm -hmm. like in our dreams so that they can see our futures. Mm Mm-hmm. Which I thought was very interesting. Yeah. We uh, see a lot of microaggressions towards Janelle. That all, so yeah, at her book symposium, that, that's, it's just all microaggressions. <laughs> yeah. Which also relates to... So it, the film opens notably with a quote from William Faulkner. Uh, the past is never dead. It's not even past. And in fact, uh, Sarah and Veronica have a conversation about that quote when they first meet. Um which is very meaningful. Like the past, the past is our present, uh, pun intended. 
Yeah. Uh, or, or in, and also that the also as a metaphor for the systemic racism that we've, we've just come to accept that it's okay to treat people this way and have in Janelle's uh, suite first of all she's staying in the Jefferson suite yeah also which I mean you know obviously she receives a bouquet like a floral arrangement and the floral arrangement has like cotton in it mm -hmm. and she doesn't know where it's from the person who delivers it um is very cold towards her, like mm -hmm. just hands it to her and walks away. Mm -hmm. But the note on the floral arrangement says, um, look forward to your homecoming. Mm -hmm. So she thinks it's from her husband, it's from her who she texts like, thanks for the artisanal arrangement. <laughs> yeah. Um, during her speech at the conference, she's talking about how we need to sort of like, because her book is called Shedding, The Coping Persona. Mm -hmm. And then she kind of ends her speech with saying, the only thing we have to lose is our chains. Mm -hmm. Our time is now. Mm -hmm. And it's that rhetoric which um, is very important and meaningful and accurate. But I think it's that that intention that is what scares these white characters mm -hmm. who are engaging in this, you know, slave camp. Did you notice the design on her book cover? Um, yeah. It reminded me of some of the some posters I've seen for, uh, for colored girls who consider suicide when the rainbow is enough. It's mm -hmm. kind of that pink, purplish yeah. butterfly. Hmm. Which I was assuming was a reference to that, but... While Janelle's character is heading down or up in the elevator, this creepy little white girl gets on the elevator. Who is on the, is on the plantation as well, obviously. On the plantation right? as well. But she has that little gollywog. She has that little, like, offensive-ass black doll dragging it by, like, a rope around its, like, a noose around its neck, dragging it around, like, ugh. This yeah, imagery, that, that was creepy. The, yeah. the imagery is very powerful. Um... I have a note that says I want Gabare, uh, just Gabare Sidibe in real life to be my friend. She just seems so uh, fun on Instagram, but even her <laughs> character in the movie, I just thought I want her to be my friend. She represents what I thought that character represents because she's a successful relationship therapist, right? I think that's or right. Relationship right. coach. She's acting very like, um, she's very over the top, very loud, very pushy. And I just thought that that character I found it interesting because I think a lot of if she would have been a skinny white lady with blonde hair, we oh. would we would think that she's just like it's expected. It's expected, mm -hmm. it's acceptable, she's bubbly, she's assertive, like don't we all love Becky? Mm -hmm. But you get this big black dark skinned woman and it's like mm -hmm. Oh a problem. Oh it's a yeah. problem. So I loved it. I loved it because oh, it's just like, oh I love it. I love how she's acting, but you can just tell that I think the casting of her was great because she just represents like what these type of people are scared of. Right. Yeah. Uh, the restaurant scene is really good because they try to seat her and Janelle and the Sarah character near the, um, the kitchen. Well, Veronica <laughs> goes to the concierge to make dinner reservations and the concierge is very rude and short with her. Mm -hmm. She makes the reservations and when they show up, they seat these bitches like in the back of the restaurant by like the dirty dishes in the kitchen. Mm -hmm. So of course Gabrielle doesn't even sit down. She's like No, we'll sit over here. Thanks. She's like, um, this is not acceptable. Uh you know why it is. I'm not gonna explain it to you. We're gonna sit over here. Thank you. And when the woman kind of when the host tries to kind of say something, uh Gabrielle's character gets loud like Well, because the in the host name tag they do a close up is Rebecca. It's Rebecca she's so like, she's hey Becky. Becky. <laughs> But I just thought it was so good because Gabrielle's character to me is like representing like what these Karens think they can do mm -hmm. and seemingly without any issue, but let, let it be a black woman and it's a problem. And also that scene has a few pertinent bits of exchanges as well because a man, uh, uh, we don't see his face. Uh, no, we don't see it. Well, we, you see it's kind of blurry, but a man off like buys Gabrielle's character a drink. But it's said in a way that makes you think this is, they're trying to... This is how they're procuring people. Right. Like, maybe Gabourey would have been, like, also a victim. Yeah. And the only reason she wasn't is because that night she didn't leave alone. She left with her white girlfriend, Sarah. Mm -hmm. Because the, she she kind of um, reads him because he buys a drink specifically for her. Uh, and it's an odd drink. It's like a cranberry something or other. Uh, yeah, it's like a Cape Cod. But then she's like, um, we're obviously, like, classy ladies at a nice restaurant. We're drinking a bottle of champagne. You should have sent over a bottle for all of us. But it makes sense because... But then she gives him his number. She gives him yeah. her number, like, but call me, this can work. Like, yeah. <laughs> but they already got Janelle hemmed up in something, the white lady right. there. Uh, and, and also that she's kind of like the only redeeming white character. Uh, Janelle Monet makes a 
a statement about how God the service is it just me or is it something up like everything everybody's my service has been awful and she's just like my service has been impeccable and they kind of look she's at just oblivious like, yeah um, but also a, an, an interesting statement about uh, the oblivious the obliviousness of white privilege sure when Veronica's kidnapped in that Uber uh -huh. by Jenna Malone. The music that's playing was really... I really liked that. It was really creepy. It's called Warm Leatherette. It's actually from 1978. I hadn't heard it. Uh, actually, I've heard uh, Grace Jones did a cover in 1980, which is the version I'm familiar with. But yeah, the very, very perfect uh, tone for that scene. So... Can, also, the score overall. Yeah. Uh, the, the opening scene and the end is the score. Uh, uh, Roman Jean Arthur... Uh, and Nate Wonder, both who have worked a lot with Janelle Monae and Jadena, um, excellent score, uh, which which makes like that slow motion torture sequence even more uh, effective. But so yeah. after the dinner scene and the kidnapping, then we end up back at the plantation, and this is when what accelerates Veronica's uh, need to leave is the pregnant woman who's. Uh, the actor's name again is... Kirstie Clemens. Sorry. Who's really good at Hearts Beat Loud. She is... During... She was the one who the stupid little white boy at dinner took back to have sex mm -hmm. with, but then mm -hmm. he didn't because he was scared. But he hits her and he kicks her in her stomach and she's pregnant. Mm -hmm. So the, the next time we see her on the field picking cotton, she's bleeding, she loses the baby, she's very upset. So... Um, there's that happening. So one day they're all in the field and the slave master comes and says like, where is this bitch? She, this, I, she can't be late again. Go get her. So Janelle goes, Veronica goes to get her and sees that she hung herself. And that was just like, that broke Veronica. Mm -hmm. So she, when she goes back out onto the field, she quietly says um, to Eli, like, like tonight's the night. Mm -hmm. Like we're going to do this. So we also found previously in the film that Veronica, the cabin she's staying in, like I mentioned, she's doing like all the tricks to see where it's not going to squeak or whatever. Mm -hmm. So that night she does her little Cirque du Soleil move out of the bed. <laughs> she like gets out of the little cabin room without waking up the slave master. Eli meets her. They find it her phone, call 911, not able to get through. Um, well, they get through and they hang up on her because it doesn't... It doesn't make Like, sense. what she's saying doesn't make yeah. any sense. But, um, they... She finds out that she needs to use his the slave master's face to unlock the phone mm -hmm. so she could write. Um, but that's all successful. The final showdown between her and the slave master, um, she stabs him, she beats him up, but then, <laughs> right when she stabs him, she yells, my name is Veronica! I thought that was a really good that scene. That was pretty good. Um... When, oh, the woman, there was a little detail that, that, um, the gold cross that the woman with the slave was wearing in the beginning, mm -hmm. it said that she was a professor. Mm -hmm. So I think that was just reiterating that the people who, the black people who these people are taking as slaves are like, you know. The, the black people are, th are, they're threatened by that are yeah. taking over white America, yeah. The best scene in this movie, and I think the best scene I've seen in a while, is when Veronica lights those three slave masters up in that crematorium. Mm -hmm. And then the shot of her walking with the torch up and the mm -hmm. flames behind her, that needs to be a poster. Mm -hmm. If that's a poster, I'm buying it and hanging it. That, it was so good. Mm -hmm. The feeling and the visual, well, and so, also, so good. And also, on the horseback ride in slow motion, I think it's quite good too. So um, the slave, one of the, the slave master's wife, Jenna Malone, is chasing Veronica, shooting at her. Um, she finally catches up to her, and at one point she says uh, that it's up to a woman to clean up the mess of a man, which I thought was really interesting, because the speech that Veronica gives at the conference talks about like the role of black women and the patriarchy, and so I just found like that juxtaposition of like. It's just so twisted, like how these white women, even in modern times, well, like all these white women who voted for Trump and even after all his shenanigans and ridiculousness and crimes and abuse, they still are like team Trump. Well, because they benefit from the hierarchy. They benefit from being so close to the power that they've, right. they've assimilated in such a way. And the, you can say the same for white gay men as well. Then Veronica, Veronica, 
The white woman gets the upper hand on Veronica for a second, but then Veronica gets the upper hand. And right before she beats the shit out of this white woman, she goes, what kind of woman are you? Yeah. <laughs> I thought that was really good. That was good. Then another really good scene is she, like, beats the dog shit out of this white woman. And then I don't think Veronica knew that the rope was tied around her. I don't think, I don't think she deliberately wanted to do this, but the rope is tied around her neck, mm -hmm. kind of. And it's still attached to the horse. So when Veronica, Janelle Monet's character, rides off in the horse, she drags the white lady mm -hmm. like like a good old lynching, drags her across. But then there's a like a statue or memorial of Robert E. Lee, and the white lady hits her head on the statue, so kills her. I thought that was a very good scene. And you know, Jenna Malone is somebody I've been a fan of for a while, so it was kind of hard to see her. It's always hard seeing white actors having to play these awful roles. Like, like Michael Fassbender in 12 Years a Slave. But they have to. They have yeah, to. Yeah, somebody's got to do There's it. Someone has to do it. <laughs> but it's just so like, oh. And then, yeah, the final scene is her riding through the Civil War reenactment, and mm -hmm. then we see the police cars come. Uh, and, another... and then people actually, like, entering the camp, like, buying tickets to watch it. Well, because the, the Civil War reenactments, like, there's this battle going on, and then you see all these signs about, no cell phone. <laughs> um, so this, to me, it makes is a great sister film to The Village, uh, the M. Night Shyamalan film, which... Is, it's much better. Than it's much better. Film. That's not a perfect film, but, you know, it's considering um, the political landscape of 2004... Uh, and in issues of white flight, uh, you know, those to me that was a, a portrait of white people that just wanted to get away uh, from, you know, uh, urban centers, as I think the language was then. Uh, and and this is the white people that want to. Control. This is far more hateful and rooted, oh yeah, and rooted in something very real. Uh, well, yeah, so exactly. was the village, but but this is the village seems benign compared to this. Right, but the village and it was also dependent on that twist we were right. Doing. This this you know the twist. Whether it's ruined for you or not, I, I don't. I think it's better knowing the twist ahead of time. But uh, is also uh, speaking to the time. Yeah. What would you give this film? Um, I would give this film four out of five stars. Uh, I I liked the look of it for the most part too. Shot by Pedro Luque, who did Don't Breathe and Body Cam. Okay. Um, it reminded me. Uh, there's a, another film I saw in Berlin this year from Marco Dutra and Catano Gattardo called. All the Dead Ones, which is about um, a similar instance of, you know, kind of uh, s slavery and white landowners at turn of the century Brazil and just as slavery had become illegal and how some of these white landowners couldn't give that up. Um, and come to find at the end of that film, it's set, like, it, the, the final shot is contemporary times, like, nothing's changed, it's still today. Um, so, so I don't know, I, I like that this is finally something that's coming across creatively. Um, it's my understanding that the reactions to this film are already kind of divisive and we're able to uh, review it damn near a month before it's actually going to be available to be seen. Mm -hmm. But I think, I think that's because Lionsgate knows how good it is. I mean, it's very good. I would give it four out of five. Uh, is there anything else you'd like to say about anybody else you'd like to call? I thought Janelle Monet was really good. Uh, we haven't really spent any time talking about besides Cid Bay performances, but this is her first lead. Um, Consistently, I liked her in Moonlight and Hidden Figures, um, supporting roles, obviously. I, I, I don't know. I was just impressed kind of all the way around. Okay. Anything else? No. All right. Bye. Bye.